when we all went to school, when we were kids, there was there was bullies, there was people that said mean things, and but you know when when all of us when we got to go home, there was this relief from two mm-hmm. thirty till seven thirty the next morning, where a lot of us got to go home to some place that's safe. Young people today don't have that because at two thirty they enter a whole new world, this digital world. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. You know, when I travel the country, this is one of the number one parenting issues that pops up now. What is? Is yeah. the whole social media and what age do you start or let them do certain things. We're going to talk about all that today. And this is one of the key things Focus on the Family is here to equip you with is what is the healthiest right thing to do? I don't know if we're going to land there today, but we're going to give you some additional ideas on what to think about, things you probably haven't even thought about yet. Today, uh, Jonathan McKee is with us to do that, and he has some wonderful insights in his new book, The Teen's Guide to Social Media and Mobile Devices. Uh, Jonathan, welcome to the broadcast. Oh, we man. haven't got you in here yet. Hey, you know what? <laughs> you guys are doing great. Glad to hey, be here. You are doing these workshops. You mentioned just last night you did one. Yeah. Uh, what are you hearing from the parents? Is what I said there a moment ago accurate? Is this one of the key areas that parents are stressing out about is social media? Uh, absolutely. And the questions are always asking is, you know, at what age? When That's do the number the, one yeah, question, When do right? we give them the device? When do we allow them on this? And then if, you know, all their friends want Snapchat, Insta, you know, what do we say to this? You know, is it bad? Is it good? So yeah, these are the big questions. Well, before we get to the one, you know, what's a good age, which we will in a moment. Let me ask you the broader question about dads and moms. Are we too concerned about this or is it harmful to kids? There's been a lot coming out uh, in the media recently about tech giants, leaders of the industry saying they don't let their kids do social media. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, (laughs) this is so new. I mean, when you look at the broader history of this thing, you know, I mean, really smartphones didn't even, you know, come into the market till Steve Jobs stood on a stage in January of 2007 and said, I've got an invention that's going to change the world. And his words proved to be prophetic. It was five years later, 2012, where America finally crossed that 50% mark of owning smartphones. And so it's kind of been in the last five or six years that we've been, sadly, experimenting with this Mm. and uh, kind of going, okay, what is this we're carrying in our pocket, this powerful tool? Our kids have started carrying it. We we now live in a world where um, the average age that a kid gets a smartphone is 10.3 years old. That's so the average. That's the average. That means so some people some more, younger. Yeah, yeah so, some you know, less than that. So yeah, I mean, so what's happening right now is everybody's asking these questions because they're going, because we're now seeing an unprecedented rise in, in teen anxiety, in depression, a 40 year high in, in teen girl suicide. So this is some scary stuff. And every single person on every one of these reports is mentioning the smartphone is mentioning social media because now there's this little device in their pocket that yeah. actually says how many friends do you have mm-hmm. how much did people like that post and John- jonathan i need to ask that question when you look at that data and that research yeah. how much of it is directly linked to those devices or is it the whole onslaught of the culture the media culture the entertainment culture and then in addition to that the phones and everything that kids have access to and well that's the big question and and it's funny because you know you'll read 20 different articles about it i have and all of them will mention a smartphone i think it would be a little you know presumptive to say it's the smartphone but it's interesting as you're seeing all the pressure they're facing all those pressures now exist on this little device Mm -hmm. in their pocket and isn't it funny that all of these experts including like you alluded to i mean remember back in uh it was january 30th of, of this year earlier that all those experts came together, wrote Zuckerberg a, le- a letter and said, hey, this whole Facebook messenger for kids for age 6 through 12 is not a good idea. And they asked him to remove that. I mean, experts are saying, wait, wait. And, and, and just so you know, I'm not an anti-phone guy. I think it's great to get kids to learn how to use his phone before they exit the house. But given to our kids at 10 years old? Yeah. Slapping them on social media right away? No. Well, let me, uh, before we get to that age question, which we promised everybody we would, yeah. <laughs> um, 
the hours on average again almost nine hours on average that young people teens are using their phones is that yeah, yeah common, common sense media had that survey but that's now actually now a couple years old here's the interesting thing last year alone nielsen reported that the average american listens to music four and a half hours a day that was for 2017. that number went up 47 minutes since 2016. Hmm. So in 2017, Americans listened to 47 more minutes per day than the year before. Now, literally, experts are scratching their heads and going, oh, this is, we've never seen a jump of 47 minutes a day in one area. This is just one area, music, of entertainment, media, and technology. So to have this kind of growth, most people are kind of just, they can only guess and project, but they're saying now we have such ease of accessing this stuff because we carry around a device in our pocket that has these great new apps with all these, new, you know, I mean, Spotify, you could choose, you know, you could follow friends lists and everything. So people are listening to more music. So those numbers of the nine hours a day are actually two years old. And I'm waiting for Common Sense Media to come out with a new survey because it's going to be higher than nine hours a day. Yeah, that's sad, isn't it? Yeah. So when we look at it, it's really a, simply a tool, but the abuse of the tool is what we're concerned about, especially as parents. How old are your kids now? Or uh, My kids are now uh, 20, 22, and 24. So you've kind of gone through it. And, yeah. and uh, our, I've got the teenagers. John, you've got 20-somethings and teenagers. And a 14-year-old, yeah. <laughs> so, and a 14 so I'm really anxious to hear what you're going to be. So when you here. look at it, uh, let's get to the age question. When is it a, a, a better time? Because I'm sure there's not a perfect time, but when is it a better time to say, okay, I want to empower you. I'm going to get you a phone. Um, for us, it was driving. Uh, Trent and Troy, you know, when they started driving, uh, that was the time we wanted to get them a phone so they could do GPS. We've been really tight on social media. We disabled that capability on their smartphones. And, uh, you know, we're easing that in. But um, that was our approach. And they're in their later teens now. But what did, what did you do? Well, you know what, and that's a that's a huge question on, on when is the perfect age, and tons of experts have been asked that. As a matter of fact, Jim Steyer, the CEO of Common Sense Media, and he's kind of the go-to guy for the government asks and everything, he was asked it, and he gave the politically correct answer of, you know, each kid is different. Well, and that's when, true. You know, you know, and, and it's true, you know, but he didn't, and they kind of pressed him, and they're like, what age, what age? So he starts saying things like, the later, the better. But right. still, he wouldn't give a number. They're like, give me a number, you know, <laughs> yeah. because... I think 40 uh, should yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so he's saying the later, the better. But finally they said, okay, what about you? You know, what about right. your kids? And he goes, when they were in high school. So again, we've got all these experts. Here's the CEO of Common Sense Media. It says in high school. Uh, let me throw some no-brainer numbers out there because I know some people are saying, Jonathan, what number? What number? Well, first of all, bare minimum. 13. And here's the reason why is those apps they want, which is Snapchat, Insta, Twitter, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, you can't have those unless you're 13 years old. And some people are saying, well, wait a second, you know, no, no, my kid's in middle school and all his 11 and 12 year old friends have this. Well, that's because when they signed up, they lied about their age right. and they put in a different year. And it's interesting how with a lot of these young people, the stories you hear is, oh, this 12-year-old who is being bullied on Snapchat and on Instagram. Right. You know, and the parents are like, I can't believe that they were being bullied on these apps. And part of me is sitting there saying, hey, do you think, do you think these parents even realize they weren't even supposed to be on these apps? So bare minimum, 13. But it really is one of those things where most people, again, we're, we're only five to six years into this. Most people are starting to say, hey, the later, the better. Don't hurry this up. Your kid doesn't need to be the average kid getting a smartphone at 10 years old. Um, you know, right. th they can they can do without this. But it stuff. is a challenge and you got to be up for the task as a parent yeah. because you're, you know, to some degree, you're going to have those discussions probably far more frequently than you want to. You know, we've talked about this over and over again. It's just not time yet. Well, mom, dad, when will it be time? Yeah. You know, and I'm, the, I'm and the 14 pressure, now, and, and the, all my friends Exactly. Have it. The pressure's on. Right. And all my friends have the phone, All my right? friends. Yeah. Every one of them. In fact, I've surveyed every teen in the U.S., and they all have them but yeah. me. They're all the only all teen in the U.S. Yeah, my kids always loved it when I'm like, oh, correction, actually, only 78% of my <laughs> yeah. friends. And they'd be like, Dad! <laughs> right. They don't, want, they the don't want to hear the numbers. But that's a, that's a really big point. That's something I'm dealing with all the time. It's, Dad, I'm the only one. And then he'll say something like, you don't know what it's like to grow up without a smartphone. It's like, well, actually, I do, but that's 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a side <laughs> argument. Right. But, but it really is hard to fit in if you don't have that thing in it, your pocket. It is. And, that, and that's what makes it so tough with us as parents. But it's also funny that um, I just talked with a, a, a wellness expert who uh, actually has counselors in schools today working with young people. And when he was talking about the different stuff that's going on and the pressures they're facing, I asked him the same question you always hear, which I said, well, what's the cure? How do we stop this? And he's all, give them time away from these devices. Get them away from these devices. And it's amazing that a lot of the experts are saying we need to get more face-to-face time, you know, because we live in a world right now where the average married person spends more time staring at a screen than they do yeah. in conversation with their spouse. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we've got to, you know, start starting from us, mom and dad, be an example of this and have tech-free zones, this kind of stuff. Well, I'm glad you raised that question. Uh, you had a horrible story of a woman and her, I think, a teen daughter in Illinois and their house caught on fire. What what was the situation oh, that, Yeah, it's, it's a crazy one. And that was as we're talking about our obsession with the phones. And, and they actually escaped with their lives. A house, house, their house was it, on fire. The house is on fire. And she realized, my phone. And she goes back in to get her phone. This is the and, mom. Yeah, and she didn't make it out. And it's like, and we have to just kind of ask ourselves, okay, what priority is this little device that, you know, right. come on. I mean, this, this is... Well, and it doesn't have to be that dramatic or tragic. I mean, I think it gets down to how, how important is it to you. And uh, that's where your ability to put it away at night, you know, when everybody comes home, yeah. put them in a basket, have dinner together, talk, socialize, maybe catch up real quick. And then one of the things we have at our home is nobody, nobody takes it to the bedroom. It all mm. stays down to recharge in the kitchen. And well, so nobody has their American phone in the Academy room. of Pediatrics has been making that recommendation yeah. since before phones. Back in 2010, they said mm-hmm. remove all TVs, all internet connected devices from your bedrooms. Well, remember, it was 2012 where America crossed that line of where we all had these devices and they stayed with it. They said, yeah. no, no smartphones in the bedrooms. Because, see, what you're talking about, Jim, is something we talked about in our last show when we talked about the whole balance between bonding and boundaries here. We know that. As a good parent, we want to bond with our kids. We want to have boundaries. Both are important. And the the hard part is if we are just that boundary parent, and that's all we are is this, you know, this limiter, 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 we never get an opportunity to, you know, have these conversations. And the one thing every single expert out there agrees on, and trust me, they don't agree on a lot. They'll all say different things on how, what levels of boundaries we should have. The one thing they all agree on is talk with your kids about this stuff all the time. Yeah. So that's, that's the big answer I can give you is we need to constantly engage our kids in conversation about these important things, which is why I wrote this book, because here's a tool we can use to talk with young people and say, hey, oh, you want to talk about Snapchat? Cool. Let's read the Snapchat chapter. And then there's discussion questions at the end of the chapter. Now let's dialogue about this and talk about it, because that's the one thing everybody agrees on. Hmm. Jonathan, I want to get into some practical helps, uh, sure. because many of us are not that tech savvy. Uh, we try. We might pop into the Apple store because something's not working right. Can you help me fix this? And in three seconds, they do it. And you're going, how am I so stupid? I couldn't figure that out. But um, privacy settings, that seems to be a real critical aspect of phones and especially your teens' phones as well. Describe what privacy settings are, why they're important, how you use them when you're downloading apps of all kinds. What does it do for, for us? Well, you know, privacy settings seems like one of those boring topics. It's the thing that when we get our phone for the first time, we just hit agree 27 times, right? You know, (laughs) because because who cares, who cares, who cares? I don't want to read all that stuff. But where it really becomes important to us as parents is, you know, if our 17-year-old daughter's alone at a Starbucks at night, you know, studying, and all of a sudden she takes out her phone, takes a picture of her Starbucks cup, and does a little post saying something like late night study session, and she hits post right then, all of a sudden now... All those forms that we click through are very important because some of the things that come you know, to mind right now uh, immediately to me are, first of all, who can read what she just posted? Who actually sees that post? Two, did she use her location when she posted that post? And here's why. And when what does she, that mean to use your location? That so, it self-identifies so when, so for example, you like at So, on, for on Instagram, on, on Snap Maps, any of these things, you have the ability to post your location or not. And if your kid read that part of the privacy settings or not, you know, they could at Starbucks say, I'm at this Starbucks, which actually puts on a map exactly where they're at. Now, if they haven't thought about who their friends are, 
and they friended somebody across town at some other school, but they've never met that friend face to face. They might think it's some other 17 year old at this school, but what they don't realize is it might be this 44 year old pedophile sitting in their basement watching that post come through right now. And now that pedophile knows exactly where she is. And when she walks out to her car, he could be right there in that parking lot. Sadly, this stuff happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Your local police station has a department dedicated to just this because young people don't think through these things like privacy settings. Who can see their posts? Uh, are they posting their location? So this is where privacy settings really are important because our kids need to think through hmm. who are we friending? What am I posting? Am I posting my location? So if we haven't paid attention to this, uh, should we today or tomorrow or this weekend, should we sit down with our teenagers and say, let's go through this together. This is not a, you know, an inquiry, but let's make sure you're as safe as you need to be. Is that a good approach? Or how would you recommend that we open the dialogue and talk about these things we may have defaulted to and we don't even know the dangers that it's opened up to us? Yeah, you know, great, great question. How that's, do we go about doing that? Yeah, and that's why I spend an entire chapter on that because I want young people to think through this. And the way I address them and the way parents should address them is probably the way I address young people in school assemblies when I talk about this. And I think it's good to use stories because if I had a school assembly say, hey, everybody pull out your phones and let's look at our privacy settings, it'll be like, you know, boring. But I just tell a story. I'll tell a true story. Like I tell the story of um, this creepy underwear guy. That's literally what the cops called him. He was this guy who would wait in malls and he'd wait in public places until people checked in. He would look at their post. He would see what they've posted. He would dig through their post and wait until he saw one where, ah, this person posted something from their home. He would sneak into their home at night, break into their house. He'd go specifically to young girls' rooms three feet from where they're sleeping. And by God's grace, he didn't ever mess with them, but he would steal their underwear. When the police finally caught him, this guy had a bunch of underwear he had collected. When I tell this story in a school assembly, you could see girls pull out their phones and start scrolling through their posts. Did I post my location? Because they're scared of some creepy guy yeah, like be. this, and they yeah. don't want a guy like this in their bedroom. So by using this kind of story approach, you know, all of a sudden I was able to talk about, hey, where, you know, who are you friending? What locations are you posting? Mm -hmm. And yeah, we need to have these conversations. How do you coach that teen girl or that teen boy on predatorial behavior in social media? What do you look for to identify somebody who is that creepy person that you don't know? Somehow you befriended them. You don't, maybe you don't even know how that happens. How, how do you identify to the best of your ability somebody who isn't appropriate? Yeah, this, this is really tough for a young girl, and this is tough for us to be able to counsel them in this area. And the best way to help our kids through this is to make sure, again, what we talked about earlier, out of bonding and boundaries, a lot of parents sit there and think, oh, I'm going to protect my kids by jumping on the boundary side here and just blocking everything. Here's where bonding is so important because the better relationship we have with our kids, the more we're going to be able to open up dialogue about this and say, hey, here's some of the warning signs. Yeah. If, you know, for example, and I, I talk about it in a book and tell them, you know, if people are asking questions about where do you live, you know, and hey, will you send What's me a What's your pic? address? Yeah. What's your phone number? Yeah, and what, what, send me a pic, you know, and, and stuff because, and sadly, lots of young men are asking to send pics as well, but... Predators very often will send a pic and then ask for, you know, someone to reciprocate, you know, now you send a pic. You know, so often, Jonathan, I could see this even in, when my, with my parenting. You know, you, you want to have this good conversation. You start it, and they're going, Dad, come on. Exactly. Come on, Dad. I mean, we already know this stuff. And you're going, you do? Are you sure you do? How do you know that as a parent that you can have confidence that your teen girl or your teen boy, that they really do understand this, that they're not just blowing it off because you're the parent? I don't want to have this conversation. It's kind of embarrassing. Well, it's got to be an ongoing conversation. And that's why as moms and dads, it's good for us to just, you know, when we read an article in the paper, when we see something, it's a good time not to lecture, but to at dinner time at one of our no tech zones, right? To sit down and go, oh, check this out. Look what I just read here. Here's the story of this young man who was, you know, gaming and he met this guy, you know, who thought was a friend and the guy asked for his address. And next thing you know, he gave the address and, and look, it actually you know, turned out to not be someone who is. Hey, you know, do you think this kind of stuff happens? Do you think it happens? To your, you know, and start asking questions. 
because the more they hear about this, they're not, I mean, they're not, that's not their select topic. Please, can I hear about these horror stories of the bad stuff yeah. that happened? But it if plants you see, a seed of caution. It does. It just, yeah. and, and when you tell these stories and then ask them, hey, what do you think? You know, do you think this could happen to you? Do you think this could happen to your friends? You know, I always start with, could it happen to your friends? Because of course it couldn't happen to me. Right. But oh yeah, no, I got friends that they don't pay attention to any of that. It's great to be able to, you know, dialogue mm-hmm. with them. Yeah. And, and that's where a lot of parents use a tool like this book because um, if their kids are showing a lack of caution in that area, uh, a lot of parents are using a book like this as kind of like a phone contract. Well, I'll tell you what, when you're done reading this chapter about privacy settings, when you're done reading this chapter about who you're friending, then you can have your phone back. Yeah, I like that idea. Mm. I don't want to end without covering the bullying issue because that's uh, something you mentioned at the top of the program. How do we as parents protect, or can we, the bullying that occurs on uh, social media, just the the grind of that, that you're not pretty enough, you're not manly enough, you're Mm. different for whatever reason, and you get attacked for Uh, those differences. What can we do? It's such a huge issue. I mean, I'm, I'm writing a whole book on that right now just because it is so big and it's so common. And the sad thing is, uh, social media is just, you know, just magnifying it and it's catalysting it to even something worse. Because, I mean, when we all went to school, when we were kids, there was there was bullies, there was people that said mean things. And I remember I had some pretty tough days, especially in middle school. But, you know, when, when all of us, when we got to go home, there was this relief from mm-hmm. 2.30 till 7.30 the next morning where a lot of us got to go home to some place that's safe. Young people today don't have that because Mm -hmm. at 2.30, they enter a whole new world, this digital world where they have to measure up even more and where their friends are actually now represented by a number. And how many do you have? You can look right there and see and compare it to your other friends. Oh, they have more friends than me. And and your posts, oh, this one isn't as liked as my other friends post. So it's so tough for young people today because there's this measurement. They're like a celebrity from 10 or 20 years ago that had to be careful every time I walked out of the house because every comment they made was judged. What they were wearing was judged. That's all our kids today. Hmm. They're being judged all the time by this little device that's being carried around in their pocket. So we as moms and dads, you know, when I asked that wellness expert, you know, what can we do? Again, his advice was give them a break from this technology. Let them realize that, you know, their value is based way more than just this little device in their pocket, you know. And we need to, you know, not only build into our kids' value, um, but we need to teach them that to, to draw their value from more than just you know, a little thumbs up, yeah. just a like, a follow. <laughs> Life is so much more than that. We need to prove that. Well, and equipping their self-worth and their appropriate healthy self-esteem in Christ to Mm. be able to withstand that withering blow. I mean, that's what all of us as parents are challenged with today, I think. And Jonathan, man, this has been so good. It has flown by. For that final word, uh, what would you tell teens today about putting down the phone and looking up? You know... That is one of those things that I think young people are actually feeling because they're frustrated because their friends are staring at devices so much. In a survey by Common Sense Media where they asked young people, have these phones become too much? 52% of them huh. said, of 52% of teenagers said, yeah, it's too much. It's become an addiction. So I think those feelings are there. They're seeing this. And so I think it's good for us to, as, as moms and dads to try to create these tech free zones and to say, hey, you know what? Um, This is a great tool for connecting with people outside the room. Let's not let it be a tool that distracts Mm -hmm. us from interacting with the people inside the room. Well, in that core number one relationship, looking up to God to say, Lord, how do I manage this? Mm -hmm. There's so much coming at me in every way. How how do I do a better job uh, to praise you and to honor you in how I manage my well, and, that's, and that's what's so fun is because yeah. that term look up is a term that's kind of being used out there look up from your device but obviously in the book I love going a little bit more into it about how we can look up also to a relationship with God well that's great thanks for being with us hey thanks hey I'm John Fuller and thanks for watching get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there and be sure to subscribe to our channel as well